Hey, welcome, Midweek uh, High Desert Bible Church. Uh, thanks for tuning in with us. Uh, do us a favor if you don't mind. Um, just like and subscribe to the channel. Help us uh, uh, put more of these uh, vids out. Uh, and I mean that by like, uh, if this is of interest to you, if the content's of interest and, you can, and you're passing it around to uh, friends and, and giving you something to talk about, then that's really what I'm interested in doing. So today we're going to turn our attention to something that uh, we probably have indirectly talked about it over the course of, of you know, eight or nine or ten different vids. But um, today I'd like to talk about um, straight murder. And you may be thinking like, well, I understand what murder is. Murder is when you premeditatively... Uh, think about how you're going to remove a person's life. So you premeditate the action, you consider it. Now there's accidental deaths, obviously. There's car accidents, there's, there's things of that nature. And unless you're just intoxicated and you involuntarily hit somebody and cause a death, they're, they're, that's a reality too. But when we talk about death amongst adults, um, we talk about the will of mankind and a will to do something heinous or to remove life. So I think before we get into this really to the depth that I try, I'm going to try and talk about it. What is life? You know, you, you, you may be watching and you're, you're taking in breath, right? You, you're supplying that air goes through into your lungs and passes through your body and and you supply the nutrients required to your brain, and you stimulate and oxygen, and your heart continues to pump. Now, the Bible says that the life is in the blood. And way back then, they probably didn't quite understand that, but today we do understand it quite well. We understand it as the heart pumps. It's pumping highways of blood through your body. And as you eat, and you, it goes through your stomach, and then it's carried through, it's... it's it's um, made back into a liquid form, so to speak, and that liquid uh, feeds the nutrients to the blood, and the blood carries it through the cells, and it, it keeps your body uh, growing and healthy and revitalized. And then, of course, you use the restroom, and you know what the byproduct of, of food is, and it's, it's a waste product after your body has extracted all the nutrients out of it. And so we have life. We have eyes that interact with a brain that is so amazing that even Darwin at one time said that his findings were absurd when he studied the relationship between the eye and the brain and how the brain has to continuously work to bring us into focus all the time. Flip things over, flip it around. You know, you turn your head fast, left or right, and yet you stay in focus. That speaks of intelligence, right? doesn't speak of a random flip the coin, need billions of years until it finally uh, turns into what life is supposed to be. No, we have life in plant life. We have life in, in the trees and we have the animal life and there's life in nature and then there's human beings. Well, <clears throat> it's also interesting that in Genesis it says that God made man in his image. And then from man, he makes woman. And his design of man and woman was for what? To procreate life. Of the man comes sperm. Of the woman comes the egg. You need the sperm and you need the egg. You need the fertilization process. Right? And so they know today that when the sperm hits the egg, uh, life begins. Life begins at conception. And so I want to talk about life in the womb for a moment. That isn't it amazing that a little sperm among thousands, if not more, millions, they're competing for that egg. And the fertilization process. Did you know that after two weeks there's blood? And the scripture again in, in Leviticus 17 says that the life is in the blood. 
the ability to carry nutrients to the body, cellular division, to carry waste out, to make that little fetus grow. That's life. Did you know the first organ created within the concept of cellular division is the heart? The heart is used to pump and keep pumping nutrients as this little baby is formed in the womb. So what is your position on abortion? Because when we talk about life in the womb, conversely, we talk about abortion, don't we? And the great argument around the world is that that's not really a child. It's not really a, a human being. And life doesn't start at conception. Arbitrarily, they determine when life should start to appease their guilty consciences. Now, there's an interesting passage, and we've talked about it before, but I think it's imperative that we talk about it again for a moment. And it's in Psalms 139, 13 to 17. First of all, the whole chapter talks about the omniscience of God, all-knowing, all-seeing. And the omnipotence of God, all-powerful. And the omnipresence of God, ever-present. And then, of course, elsewhere in Scripture, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, it says that God is immutable. Big word, God doesn't change. He's inerrant. He's infallible. And then in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ is said that, what? He's the same today, yesterday, and forever. Amen. He doesn't change. So one thing that you absolutely can know for sure, it's an absolute truth that God doesn't change. Man changes. Man is always adapting. You can see it in religion. Religion changes with the times. People change their doctrine. They change their positions. They change everything to fit the needs of man because religion requires of man to pay them to operate, so to speak. Dead religion doesn't do anybody any good. So when we think about the omnipresence of God and we think about the omnipotence of God and we think about the omniscience of God, then we think about Psalms 139. When David says, the writer of the 103rd Psalm says that wherever I am, God, you see me. Wherever I might go, whether I go to the highest part of heaven or whether I descend to the lowest part of Sheol, you are there. You are acquainted with my ways. You know my thoughts before they come to me. You, you know the words on my, in my mouth or in my soul or in my spirit before they come out of my mouth and my tongue wags them out. The Bible says that God is very much acquainted with our ways. And now in the Psalms in 139, it says that, that God stood there, and I'm going to paraphrase, but God was right there when you were being formed and, and put together in your mother's womb. That he knew you and he was acquainted with your ways. He watched over you. He fashioned you. In other words, God in his sovereignty never missed a beat when it came to the child in the womb. It's as if God held them in the palms of his hands. Now, some children don't make it out of the womb naturally. Does that mean that God foresaw evil in their life down the road, potentially, and took them home before their time? There's comfort in knowing that. There's comfort in knowing that, that God is God, and that when he chooses, the word says that, that man's life is in the palm of his hands. We are but a vapor, it says, that passes away. Did you know that in God's economy, you are but a vapor? And that he holds you in the palms of his hands. You know you have something involuntary, an organ going on in your body. Did you know it? Your heart's involuntary. You know you can be brain dead and your heart keep pumping? It's an involuntary muscle. It keeps pumping. 
So when we start to talk and introduce this conversation into the ugliness of abortion, it is murder. People like to say, it's my body and I get to choose what I want to with my body, but let's just call it what it is. It's murder in the womb. It's not taking care of the innocent. It's putting to death uh, a child because of convenience sake. Because a child is inconvenient. A child costs money. A, a child takes time to raise. And sometimes people, they want the joy of procreation. They want the joy of sexual pleasure. They want the joy of pleasures mostly due to lust, they love that. They feed it. They like it. But when they're not cautious and they're not careful, see, then what? Because you're, you're practicing sexuality outside the guises of an ordained union that God predetermined in marriage, and so lust brings people together, and they don't think it through, and they enjoy the union between a man and a female, and what happens? The sperm and the egg join nine months later, sometimes less, seven months later, sometimes prematurely, but life is growing in the womb and the mother changes. And the placentia inside of her, the nutrients are contained. You know that the baby doesn't have the mother's blood own blood it's within that sack and it's all the nutrients that come and the mother's body expels the wastes and etc it is really a miracle of life to consider the babe in the womb and how God oversees the, the construction so to speak it's not an animal it's, it doesn't have a tail likened to what people would say a tail is it's not an animal that comes through and becomes a person. It's a person before it has essence. It's a person when, when sperm fertilizes the egg. And so if you're contemplating an abortion today, if you're thinking about, because it's inconvenient and you don't know how to handle it and you don't know what to do, don't let people talk you into murdering a child. If, if you want to have the baby and give it up for adoption, so be it. There's many of people out there that want babies. There's many of people that can't have them. The tragedy is those that want them that can't are watching people that can and don't want them. Now, when you talk about murder in the womb, you have to talk about racism. You have to talk about a wickedness and an evil that comes from the heart of man. And really, it started in, in some of the cities, if you want to know the truth, started in New York with a woman by the name of Margaret Sanger. And Margaret Sanger thought that black people were ignorant and that all they were doing is making babies and that they were impoverished and they couldn't take care of them and therefore they were ignorant and they were going to be a plague to society. So she started, with the assistance of others, Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood just didn't happen yesterday. Go back to the 1800s. Go back when it was a popular thing to eradicate minorities that were considered less than the affluent of society. They popularized the idea that it was okay to rid a woman of a child. Well, if you don't want to have a child, maybe you shouldn't consider sex. Are there complications? Of course. Are there all kinds of things that goes on? Maybe a complication that may take the mother's life. Maybe a complication that may injure the child. There's, there's too many things that can happen and that sometimes do happen. I'm not here to be judge and jury. God will do that. What I'm saying today is that this is legalized murder today, and it's gone even farther than murder in the womb. 
It's gone farther than murdering in the womb. Now, did you know it's legal to kill a child up to 23 days after birth from the womb? Infanticide says that it's legally in some states, California specifically, that you can take the life of a child up to 23 days. Is that not murder? Why is killing a child within the uh, confines of 23 days okay without persecution, without going to jail for it, without committing a crime? And yet, if that child were to grow and become one or two or three and that child is killed, then it's murder. Or an adult that takes an adult's life, it's murder. But the child, it's not murder for a child? Why are, why are people eradicating a next generation? Why are they removing the greatest blessing that God has given humanity that they get to procreate, that they get to see life, that they get to see life from the womb? Did you know that Planned Parenthood uses $2 million a day of taxpayer money? Did you know that they kill minimally of 1,000 a, a babies a day? If you kill 1,000 babies a day for 365 days, you're killing three, three, or 365,000 kids. How many kids have we killed since 1973, Roe versus Wade? Countless millions. And so when the Supreme Court reversed Roe versus Wade, people went in arms. Did you remember? They were screaming and yelling. We have the right to kill. We have the right to kill. Does anybody have the right to kill? To take life that's not your own? Because it's inconvenient? Because it doesn't suit you? And when did it become political? When was abortion a political issue? Politicians have used it as a political issue because it's so important. We are eradicating thousands and thousands and thousands of children across the board. White, black, brown, yellow, red, whatever. There's no partiality in abortion. There's only wicked, evil people that want to enslave people into committing the act of murder. But then dare they say that it's murder, they don't. It's called planned parenthood. We're going to show you how to plan to be a parent. You can have all the sex you want and make all the babies you want. And if you don't want them, just flush them. That's legalized murder. And then on top of that, the powers that be within the walls of Planned Parenthood have figured a way how to make money off the aborted fetuses. And some speculate that that's the real reason why the abortion industry is a multi-million, if not billion dollar industry a year, selling parts, selling um, uh, fluids, and selling the cells that can be injected into other older people. If God stood and watched the child being formed in the mother's womb, does he not know them intimately? Does he not know that they're male and female? There's no guesswork with God. Did, did he know their name? Did God foresee what they would be named by their parents later? Sure. Nothing eclipses God. Nothing gets by him. See, man wants to play God, and man wants to be God. And the people that understand what they're doing are convincing, seducing, and deceiving many people so that they don't see the reality of what true murder is about. 
the Ten Commandments that God put together for humanity, one of them says, thou shall not kill. Did you know at one time there was consequences for killing? If you accidentally killed, there was uh, a law that gave way and that you could go to a, a, a city of sanctuary and so that the relative of the deceased wouldn't get angry and take your life and you could wait till it cooled down and the elders of the city would look and see if it was a true accident or not. If a person premeditatively killed somebody, he was dragged outside and stoned on the spot. It was eye for eye, it was tooth for tooth, it was foot for foot. And God has never rescinded that. Mankind has done that. Mankind today can take a life, and it's worth about seven years in a prison system. Sometimes it's worth life. So they get to live their life three hots in a cot, while the other person is snuffed out, because what? People think it's inhumane to kill a convict that has taken a life. Where will it stop? Well, where is a murderer? Where does it stop? Murders. Satan was a murderer from the very beginning. And so we see then, when the heart isn't right before God, the heart is in the hands of the will, and the desire is in the hands of a Satan, of a devil that hates humanity. And he convinces humanity to eradicate life, to make life better for the few, rather than better for the whole. The Bible says that Satan robs, steals, and destroys. Now, you know how I know that that's true, by the way? I don't claim to be an expert on these things. But one thing I do know, in almost 45 years now, sitting across the table from a lot of different people in different lifestyles and walks of life and people from around the world, I've spoken with people that have taken the stand and, and had an abortion. You probably don't hear much about how guilty they feel in their lives and, and how it's ruined their life to think that they could have been a mother, but they were too young to understand. And, and, and parents and, and relatives put too much pressure on them. It would look bad if, if my daughter gets pregnant and she's in church. It's going to look bad. If my daughter gets pregnant and, and, and she doesn't go to my club, it's going to look bad. And they convince that child, they convince that young lady to abort that child, to murder that child. And years later, that young lady realizes that she forfeited the right to be a mother to a child. That does things to a man's or woman's psyche. Yeah, men too. The boyfriends that have talked the girls into abortions or the men that talk their wives into it. Do you know that married couples even have abortions? Because the child that they wanted didn't come out, the, or they didn't get what they wanted, so to speak. People want a boy and they keep getting girls. They don't want a girl. All around the world, there's different traditions and dowries. Little females are slaughtered every day around the world because it costs too much or it, it weighs on the family too much. So you see, it becomes a spiritual situation. It becomes a spiritual thing when people no longer feel guilty about taking a life. And if Satan has come into the world to rob, steal, and destroy... Jesus Christ has come into the world to seek and save the lost. And if you've had an abortion in your life, there's hope for you. There's forgiveness for you. Forgiveness is found in Jesus Christ alone. He went to the cross. God became flesh and dwelt among mankind. And He lived His life and He showed us how to live life. And he gave us his word. He gave us a, a, a book to show us how to live life and live it to its abundance. And that life would be good and joyous. And one of the gifts that God gave us 
on top of salvation is forgiveness. Oh, to be forgiven. Oh, to have a clean conscience. Oh, to be set free by the blood of Jesus Christ when a person kneels and, and, and seeks a forgiveness through repentance, a humbling of oneself. Not penance, not feeling sorry, but a true act of brokenness that they repent and say, Oh God, unto you alone have I sinned. I've broken your commands. I've broken your rule and your law. I need forgiveness. And God says if we would cry out to him and ask for forgiveness, he would forgive us because there's power in the blood of Jesus Christ and there's forgiveness in the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins towards God. Forgive me that I am a sinner. Forgive me that my mind is seared and I don't see it the way that God's word sees it. I was ignorant and didn't know. Forgive me. Come now, receive me, come enter into my life. Fill me with your spirit. Make me born again, make me different, make me a new creation. And by faith you say the prayer, and by faith God moves and he comes and he fills your life, and there's a change within you. Sin will always blind, grace will always open our eyes. If you're contemplating abortion, please don't. Consider the child. Protect the innocent. Carry the child and put it for adoption. Bless somebody's life. Don't end a life. And once again, if you've had abortions or multiple abortions, as some people have, there is forgiveness and restoration in Jesus Christ alone. But really, is, is the issue the child or is the issue sex outside of marriage? Or is the issue having sex with no responsibility? Or is, or is the issue sex with no accountability? Weigh up the consequences. I'm not naive. Some of you will not protect yourselves from becoming pregnant. If you're going to have sex and nobody's going to tell you anything, I'm at least going to tell you, prevent it. If you don't believe in God and you're willing to do whatever you have to do, I, I can't stop you. I would that you wouldn't. I would that you wouldn't prostitute your body. I would that you wouldn't give up the very precious thing that God gave you. But if you're going to, be, be responsible and accountable to what you're doing because God is right there. There's no darkness with God. All is, is light. He sees it all. He knows it all. And if you've accepted the Lord today, if you ask Him to come into your life, please tell somebody. P please make your faith active and get a hold of a Bible. Get an NLT. Get a New Living Translation. It's simple. Start reading the book of John. Drop a little bleep. Let us know. Somebody will contact. We'll, we'll, we'll try to follow up. We need to be better than what many people in this country have no problem doing. We need to make a stand for righteousness. We need to make a stand for children and protect the innocent. Gracious Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for the word. Thank you, Lord, that I pray that it speaks to our heart with this situation of abortion that's running rampant in our country. God, we are going to pay dearly for the children that have been aborted. We're going to pay dearly for rebelling against you, the living God, and taking life and, and being so haphazard about it, thinking that it's nothing. Oh, God, life is in the womb and life is at conception. We thank you, Lord, for life, and we thank you, Lord, that each one of us, by God's grace, had somebody that looked out for us and got us through the womb and then got us through life to where we're at today. So, Lord God, thank you we're not animals. Thank you, God, that we're created specific, unique, that, Lord, you have us on the palms of your hands. So I thank you and praise you for this day, Lord. Just be with us. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.